And now it is time for our questions for the keynote speaker and our panelists. Would anyone like to start out? I'm not sure it's really an open access versus it's a, it's a digital distri yeah, distribution, yeah. and you know, in, in uh, one of the things that's kind of frustrated me, you know, back in 1996 when I started my journal, and I thought, wow, this would be great, you know, people could, uh, you know, say put data sets and, and and so on, and it was like throwing a party and nobody showed up. I've, I've had three <laughs> articles. Uh, actually, one of them was the first year that was it was a wonderful article. It was on uh, problem-based learning, which is a you know, commonly used in medical schools as a way of where you have small groups. And one of the researchers actually took tapes of problem uh, learning groups and, and analyzed it, but then actually put the tapes up tied to the uh, to the manuscript. Now, you know, boy, this is what I wanted, you know, and then so on. But it's happened, I think, as I said, three times in 16 years. It's it's, uh, and again, I think it's a it's part of the problem is uh, we're still figuring out how to use digital distribution and we're kind of set in our ways and not thinking broadly. Part of that, and part also, uh, uh, like publishing data has a whole lot of, uh, brings a whole lot of issues around it. It depends on which field, but um, uh, um, I think scholars are reluctant to do it somewhat, you know, just out of habit, but somewhat it, it uh, um, poses some real, uh, I don't know if they have to go into it, issues of when you publish, I mean, how do you document it? In the case of uh, biomedical data, there's issues about uh, patient confidentiality. I mean, there's a whole, and, and every field is different, but, but I think it's, it's great. I wish we see do more of it, but we haven't, but it's not an OA issue. I guess it's related more to OA and law, since yeah. OA yeah. is law yeah. with yeah. like legal information. Yeah. And I do think that one of the interesting things in the legal context is that you can see in a really concrete way um, why certain database publishers are able to charge significant sums of money because they actually provide an awful lot of additional value to what they're providing. So I mean, I, I think that people don't object, well, they may object that they think it's too expensive, but I mean, they don't, they don't object in principle to paying for Lexis or Westlaw or mm -hmm. Hein Online, whatever. And, and the LI isn't And, and the governments are getting better, they just don't have very good, in my experience, government websites providing legal information are often not particularly easy to use. Um, so, and the LI is great, I use it all the time, and I, I recommend to my students, so, absolutely. Yes? Uh, well, as librarians, we know that a lot of our students use Google email for that too. With the scholarly publishing, a lot of them don't use Google effectively, so, you get, I see the analogy is a good one, like, Try to get your open access into databases or public open finding areas. Work for 12 years to get my journal into PubMed and and so on. Finally, did it and 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 that, that brings up another point that I think Neil brought up. Um, yes, it's not hard to create an online journal yourself and do it. I mean, but to do it well, I mean, things like. Uh, I mean, it was one of the hardest things I had to do was to decide to start charging an article processing fee on our journal. But that was the only way I could get into PubMed because we had to create a XML version and uh, National Library of Medicine is incredibly um, uh, particular about that. So, it's, uh, yeah, uh, um, yeah, but, and then, you know, getting into Scopus and, and, and so on, it's, it, it's tough. But it's, it's helpful to have, that's why I think library publishing services, you know, it really is added value that they can help 
you know, do things that as scholars we can't do on our own. We're not professional. I wanted to say just something in terms of, I think Steve or Gilbert, uh, in terms of uh, post-publication peer review, that has been tried. Uh, uh, Nature did a very nice study on it. Um, uh, I tried it in my journal for a year, and, it, and, it, and it's, again, it's like throwing a party that nobody shows up. You get comments like, gee, this is a great article. I mean, <laughs> and, you know, it, it just, it, and I don't know why, but it just hasn't worked. I think that's this hard thing is, you know, how do you get over that? And that's why I really like scope, but it's one field they figured out a way to do it. Um, uh, but our, our library, same thing, and when it got up to, I don't know, like 150,000 a year, you know, and again, it was like pouring water down. I mean, and, and, it, and it's tough because, you know, you still got to buy your subscription journals, and, it's, and, and so, you know, where does that money come from? And I don't know the answer to that one. Um, uh, it, the point, point is that it, it takes funding to publish, to, to do publishing, to, or not funding, so it takes resources to, to do uh, publishing, it takes professionals can do it a lot better than scholars. It's, and, and I'm all for journals like Neil's and, and mine, I think it's great for scholars to get involved, but it, it's tough to do a good job without professionals. It takes resources. The question is how are we going to do that while you know, trying to switch to that from one model to another? if anybody's had any answers to that. We, we do have time for one more question. Well, I, I wonder if, if yeah. some of the other panels can follow up on that. And, and if I can add to what uh, was just being asked. Uh, it, it seems that um, there, there are uh, pieces of the traditional model all, all being represented mm -hmm. here. So um, traditional publishing, we see the university subsidizing a lot of the process. The library is, is one of those points, but the university higher education also subsidizes peer review, and in fact they're subsidizing the production of the, the material. And, and so I, I wonder, um, since we have uh, publishing, higher education, and, um, and, and you know, all, all and the library, uh, you know, all of those pieces, um, it, is there something that maybe uh, higher education and I would just venture to say, I mean, it seems to me the important thing to think about is what the, what the purpose of these different institution is, uh, institutions are and, um, and how to better uh, enable them to achieve those purposes. So I was struck by what you were saying about you know, the role of academic presses. But it seems to me that rather than see open access and academic presses as being opposed to one another, to ask in what way academic presses can use open access and the tools that it mm -hmm. provides to better achieve the, the, the charitable mission that they exist to, to support. Just quickly, that, that's the essence of what I was saying. We shouldn't be antagonists. We, I mean, we're really, we have the same goals, we have the same purpose. Um, and I think what, what I've said to others is, if the Kentucky legislator passed a law tomorrow to pay our overhead costs, we would gladly and gleefully make everything available for free. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, not, it's not about self-preservation, it's about we think it costs this much to make it scholarship. It's, and, and, access, and open access is a distribution question. Yeah. And I think we worry about the financial model mm -hmm. because we've gotten beaten up 
and, uh, and, and, and so yeah, that's what I'm trying to foster is a communication and an understanding of, of how we can complement each other. I guess, and I guess I do wonder whether the potential to reach a larger audience might make it easier for more people to understand the kind of value that's produced by academic presses. Yeah. You know, the more material you can get out there and the more people are able to take advantage of it, the more they understand how valuable a resource they provide. Real quickly, there's two schools of thought. Um, I believe if you put the content out there for free, it, people will buy it if they want it. I mean, it's, you know, with every book we publish, 80% of it is available on Google. And, and authors will occasionally freak out. Why are you, it's like a library. You can go to the library, you can pull it off the shelf, you can read it. This is making the, 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 the book available, but there are those who think that's, you're cutting into your sales. Yeah. I'll, I'll give a, I know we're probably running out of time, but, but my response, unfortunately, at this point, is non-alternative, maybe more of a diagnosis. So. Uh, Scholars, uh, Gary Rhodes and Sheila Slaughter, they talk about the term academic capitalism. And they talk about really beginning in the 80s, but certainly in the 90s, you started seeing colleges and universities engage in market and market-like behaviors, where there's this emphasis on monetization. Uh, in higher education, we've seen in an intellectual property side, you had the Bayh-Dole Act, which meant universities were suddenly in the business of trying to make money off of patents. Mm -hmm. And so, as we've um, increasingly in the last couple of decades gone where we've seen a retrenchment from the state and even federal support kind of undergirding the higher education enterprise. What we've seen is the enterprise is trying to figure out how to fund itself and the things that it does. Mm -hmm. And uh, through the lens of academic capitalism, what you've seen is uh, units on campuses and um, have tried to figure out a way. And this own institution, we're seeing it kind of with this new budgeting process that's being proposed. In other words, instead of uh, kind of distributing the, the cost in the enterprise, what we've gone to is, is you have models um, where uh, University of Virginia, for instance, their business school was one of the initial ones as a public institution. It kind of broke off and said, okay, we're going to be self-sustaining. The law school did the same. And so I think when we talk about university presses, we talk about open access, I think we're caught up in this really much larger debate in this, this country. I, a visiting scholar uh, the other day I heard from Italy was talking, it was like, you know, for Europeans, this idea that people show up and they're paying to go to college. They're like, oh, that's just really strange. You know, they're starting to introduce fees in places, and in places like the UK, that certainly is a big issue. Um, but we're, we're at a fundamental struggle for what it means uh, to be higher education institutions. And, and are, are we serving the market? Or are we serving something called the public good? Now, that's really lofty ideas that are being talked about. And at the end of the day, we have to you know, pay for the lights uh, and do things like that. Uh, but I don't think we've got a great answer to that yet. And I think it involves kind of the heart and soul of American higher education, what we eventually get to for the answer. Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank our speakers this afternoon. And many thanks to all of you for coming. Although this is Open Access Week, open access issues are something that we should be discussing all year long. As you leave the auditorium, we do have additional material that I invite you to pick up so that we can continue these discussions uh, later. Also, I would uh, mention that on the back of your program for uh, today, there is the URL for UK Knowledge, which will also have some information from today's events and other information on, on open access.